Okay, I think we're there. We're gonna um, get the program rolling for today. Welcome everyone. We are glad you could join us for today's webinar on easing the transition to STEM higher education for students with di disabilities. This webinar is made available by the Northwest Higher Education Accessible Technology Group. Northwest HEAT is a joint project of the Orbis Cascade Alliance and NWAC, the Northwest Academic Computing Consortium. Our mission is to advance our common goal of ensuring that digital services, information systems, learning technologies, and instructional and scholarly resources are equitably accessible to all users. Our overarching goal is to cultivate a community of practice among faculty and staff who support digital accessibility on their campuses. To do this, we provide a series of professional development opportunities and we share best practices and resources through a knowledge base we collaboratively support. If you would like more information about the work of Northwest HEAT and how you can participate, we invite you to contact us at info at nwheat.org or visit our website at northwestheat.org. You can also communicate with us through the poll that we will share at the end of this session. Before we introduce our presenters, we will take a moment to share some housekeeping details. This session includes a chat, which means you can submit questions to our presenters throughout the session. Your questions will be addressed. Uh, they will be monitored and addressed uh, throughout the session. Um, and there will be some opportunities for your input as well. This meeting is also open mic, which means you will be able to ask questions by simply unmuting your mic to ask your question during the Q&A time at the end. Until that time, we ask that you keep your mic muted. This session includes captioning. You will find instructions on how to access captioning in our Zoom chat. And finally, this session is being recorded. Uh, we will post the recording to our YouTube channel and website, and we'll send an email notification to all participants when the recording becomes available at northwestheat.org. And with that, I'm going to move on to introducing our panel of speakers. We are super excited today to have this uh, group of folks from the Colorado School of Mines. Um, Seth Vuletic is the scholarly communications librarian. Uh, we first met Seth when he participated in a panel uh, last fall on accessibility in open education resources. And uh, I definitely wanted to learn more about uh, what they were doing at Colorado School of Mines. So we invited him to come back. And uh, his colleagues with us today are Brianna Buljung. Sorry if I messed that up. Is the <laughs> teaching and learning librarian at Colorado School of Mines. And I'm so excited. We have a panel of students with us today. Jamie Regan is an undergraduate in electrical engineering. Allie Izell is a, in her third year at the Colorado School of Mines studying metallurgical and material engineering. And Maddie Fox is an undergraduate in environmental engineering. Um, if you want to get their full bios, you can find that information published on uh, the event page on our website. And with that, I will turn it over. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so we're just going to get started here. Okay. <clears throat> All righty. So first off, we would really like to thank Jamie, Ali, and Maddie for taking time, especially at this busy time of the year, <laughs> um, to share their perspectives um, and some of their experiences. So what we're going to do, um, or sort of our, our plan for today, we're going to start off with a little bit of an introduction into um, sort of the problem and, and what we have done so far in some of our work. Um, work that Jamie's been instrumental in moving forward. Um, and we want to save the vast majority of our time today um, for 
questions and discussion um, with our amazing students here. Yeah, we found it so valuable ourselves um, to interact with students and understand uh, what their experiences are on campus and um, wanted to sort of share this with you. We have this excellent group here, um, the uh, Ore Diggers Disability Activism and Community uh, Student Group um, that Jamie actually co-founded. Um, and uh, it has, um, it's been eye-opening to, to be able to interact with them. Um, and we're really grateful that they're willing to do this for us. Okay, so to provide a little bit of background, um, Seth and I became involved in accessibility work here at Mines through the Colorado Department of Higher Education's OER grant, so Open Educational Resources. Um, when they fund institutions here in the state, they require that materials created be accessible, um, but there's not a ton of support for that or not a ton of instruction in how we actually go about doing that. Um, so Seth's predecessor began the accessibility course for education. It, it is an OER. Um, you can get it right there at the QR code. Um, it's a fully open course that helps faculty remediate their course materials um, or learn how to create accessible from the beginning. Um, and that sort of mandate and then the development of what we call ACE um, has really sort of launched a whole area of research um, for us. So uh, ACE led to a presentation at the North central section of the American Society for Engineering Education Conference about um, some of our work in accessibility. And we were asked by a couple of high school educators at that conference what MINDS is doing to support students transitioning from high school to college. And we didn't have an answer. Um, and it doesn't seem like many people have answers. Um, and so that launched our amazing work with Jamie, our undergraduate researcher. She's been with us for two years now working on the project. Um, and I think we're coming to a much better understanding at this point. Oh, shoot. <laughs> we're having a lot of connection issues here. Are we still connected? Can you hear us? Uh, yes, we can hear you. We just can't see your screen anymore. Okay. So it's, I think that the, the hard wire connection is working. Just anything that was on Wi-Fi has seemed to have dropped off. Um, but that is okay. We can pivot for a minute. Um, so let me come over here on this screen and see if I can open up my presentation again. I apologize. Technical difficulties. Was not expecting that. These things could happen to anybody. <laughs> I'm glad it didn't happen during finals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had a power outage once during finals. It was great. Did you really? I was great. I was just thinking about this, like what if they were to have like a fire alarm or something right in the middle of a presentation like this? Um while we're uh waiting, we would love to hear where everybody is coming from. So if you don't mind putting sort of location and, and the sort of work that you do in accessibility in the chat, we would love to learn more about um what all of you are doing. If you're able to get in there. Yeah. By all means. I think Oh, I'm seeing that I'm disconnected. Maybe. Why is the Wi Fi? Oh, is it coming back? Oh, no, that's me. Oh, that's you. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. I am back. We were here. There. Here. 
I saw it briefly it's and then it has good. gone black again. Yeah. Well, we'll just talk a little bit about it. <laughs> um, I'm almost there. Um, so what we sort of noticed through our research, um, so Jamie uh, and Brianna and I, we started uh, doing a literature review um, and uh, then have like sort of decided that it's necessary to dig a little bit deeper and develop a survey. So um, we're surveying high school students or high school educators and um, college students on their experiences um, with preparing students for, for, um, for higher education. So it looks like we're back. Um, <laughs> Hooray. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we, did, we designed the survey. Right now we're kind of in the process of administering the survey and analyzing results kind of sim simultaneously. Um, we had really good student responses. Um, I think MIMES has a really strong uh, student population who's willing to share their experiences. Um, high school faculty were a little bit less uh, willing to, to participate for various reasons. And there seems to be like some logistical issues with interviewing high school students or educators, not high school students. I think there would be all sorts of issues with that. Um, but, um, we're working on getting more responses. We've gone through various approvals um, with uh, different individuals um, and uh, groups to make sure that we can get our survey to these high school students. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the, the survey process um, and what we've learned through the literature review. So first and foremost, there are big achievement gaps in STEM for students with disabilities. Or achievement gaps sort of across the board for students with disabilities. Um, this graph is one that I put together from various sources, um, but it's kind of difficult to gauge um, how accurate these data are because um, disability is like self-disclosed and a lot of folks elect not to do that. Um, so from the U.S. Census, we know Roughly 13% of people identify as having a disability um, of the non institutionalized population. Um, and then it seems like 20.5%, um, according to the National Institute for Education Statistics, I believe, National Center for Education Statistics, um, enroll in higher education or bat bachelor programs. Um, so that seems like overrepresentation. I think that there might be some skew to this data. Um, folks with learning disabilities may not disclose that to the census, but they probably will disclose that um, to their uh, their undergraduate institutions so that they can receive accommodations for that. Um, but from the same National Center for Education Statistics, uh, Folks who are enrolled in post baccalaureate programs, it's like 10.7%. So now we're back to underrepresentation, regardless of what metric you're using. Um, and then uh, working in STEM from uh, the uh, National Science Foundation, we know roughly 3% of, of um, the disabled population, or 3% of the, the folks who are working in STEM I identify as having a disability. Um, so it seems like every sort of barrier is just bigger. Um, so each of these different things that you know you might consider like a, a challenge to get past um, is just that much more amplified when um, students have a disability. So we have a question for you here. Um, oh. I'll ask you to post in uh, the chat because yeah. yeah. um, yeah. yeah. of, of issues here. But so fill this blank in. For me, the most challenging thing in college was, um, and then I'll have our students here respond a little bit to, to some of what they've learned uh, through ODAC and their own experiences.
knowing how and who to ask for help, figuring out what I wanted to do and how to get there, <laughs> time management. Yeah, I think knowing who and like how to ask for help is really hard, especially if you have a disability, just because a lot of the times, you know, it's not something that's really talked about in, you know, public and the resources are, can be very like, you know, it's like one department at the school and you have to go find them. Um, but then also, you know, if you had a disability in high school, you kind of had your parents, your paras, everybody helping you out and then you come to college and you have to be an adult <laughs> and figure it out so that can be really hard you have keeping up with schedules and deadlines work-life balance work school life balance imposter syndrome yes leah absolutely mm -hmm. um being thousands of miles away from your community yeah yeah that was something I struggled a lot with whenever I came to Colorado because my family's from North Carolina. And so not only was I dealing with being away from home, but I was dealing with, okay, I have this medical issue. I have no one here to help me arrange a doctor's appointment or no one here to support me and ask questions to. Yeah, lots of time management. Um, I think that like that's something that probably everyone can relate to. Um, but Imagine also like having to have test accommodations that are now at a separate time, mm -hmm. um, separate location, and it takes longer. Everything takes longer sometimes yeah. when you have learning disabilities um, or you're trying to even get from class to class. So I think all of these things can really impact students' abilities to thrive um, in their undergraduate programs. Gaining mastery in courses outside my core disciplines. I think that that's a universal struggle. <laughs> in my discipline. <laughs> Definitely. What is electrical engineering? <laughs> okay. Okay, next. Next slide. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so some of the challenges that we find that are uh, unique to, to students with disabilities um, are regulatory support. So in high school, like Jamie mentioned, students are supported by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, as well as Section 504 and ADA that covers everybody. But then in college, it's just Section 504 and ADA, which are less robust, less robust um, and don't provide the um, IEPs and stuff like that that help students uh, thrive at the same level as their peers. Um, then there's the independent issue. I think Jamie also touched mm -hmm. on this. Um, you have your family and caretakers to help advocate for you, um, as well as a little bit of self-advocacy, but then it's just almost entirely self-advocacy and it becomes very challenging. Um, a lot of students don't know where to go or even where to start. Um, then there are institutional barriers as well. STEM has its own set of acceptability issues. Um, this was one of the challenges in developing the accessibility course. Things that are, you know, visually represented are very difficult to represent in other ways. Um, a lot of field work that uh, is sort of prohibitive to folks with physical disabilities. Um, and then we find that instructors are kind of lacking training as well. Um, institutions sort of across the board have lack of staffing support, but especially in uh, disability offices, I think they tend to be pretty understaffed. Um, so even if they want to support students, they're not always able to. And then there's a lot of lack of representation. So if students don't see folks like themselves thriving in a discipline, they're unlikely to pursue it. Um, so I think all these things are sort of challenges that we're noticing throughout the literature. Next slide, sorry, I keep forgetting. Um, so um, we designed a survey to sort of understand this problem a little bit better. Um, we are, like I said, surveying high school teachers. Uh, we wanna understand what they're doing to prepare students for the transition to higher ed, um, what significant challenges do they see students facing when they enter college, um, what they think colleges are doing well, if anything. Um, and what they think colleges could do better. So 
we wanted to gain their perspective, but I think more important than that, we wanted to gain the student perspective. Um, and so we were asking them sort of what their pain points are with the transition and our campus, um, what they uh, think would help them ease that transition, what advice they might provide students with disabilities prior to entering college, and what campus resources they're using. Um, so one of the first questions we asked from the students was, how much do you agree with the following statements? And these were things like, um, how prepared are you for high school? Do you know your rights? Um, if they found anything challenging, or if they found it challenging to find a community or a support system, and we used a Likert style scale for that. So as you can see, as far as the, I was prepared for the transition to higher education question, um, most of them felt that they were prepared. Uh, there was a small percentage that said that they, you know, weren't really prepared. But then if you look at the question about whether they knew their rights when they started college under ADA and se section 504, you can see that a majority of them said that they did not know their rights. So they felt they were prepared for college, but didn't necessarily know what rights they had in that environment. So that would be something to maybe, you know, in future programs talk about, you know, what are your legal rights in college? Because that is very important when you're trying to self-advocate. And then as far as the question of what challenges they faced, finding a community or a support system, it was pretty split on that one, um, as far as who agreed that they had challenges with that and who disagreed, which brings us to the next question we asked, which was, do you think clubs or organizations on campus uh, would help them feel they have a community? And it kind of reflects that previous question about whether they had trouble finding a community where it was actually split right down the middle on whether they felt that clubs and organizations helped or did not feel that. So something that we would like to ask, you know, maybe in a follow-up survey is why they answered the way they did. You know, um, did they maybe have a bad experience with a club and just don't want to go back and try other ones? Did they come here, you know, are they local and they already had friends so they just didn't need to go out and um, be, I guess, be social in clubs and organizations? So this is a question that we had a lot of follow-up thoughts on and would like to learn more about. And then um, one of the, I guess, important questions we asked, well, they're all important, but this one, you know, trying to figure out who everyone feels is responsible for preparing students. And you can see on the left, um, the student responses, they put a lot of pressure on themselves. Um, a lot of the students said that, you know, they are completely responsible for preparing themselves for college. And then um, they said a little bit, you know, some of them said primary caregivers, some of them said college educators, but most of them said that, or a lot of them said that, you know, it's their responsibility. But then they also, you know, they did also agree that it's not just them, which reinforces that idea that they need a community. So, the students said, you know, their primary caregivers, their high school educators, rehabilitative services, college educators, everybody has kind of that role in helping them prepare. And then as far as faculty responses for this question, none of the faculty said anybody was completely responsible. And also um, a lot of them, you know, agreed that yes, students are responsible, but then they also placed a high responsibility on um, like caregivers themselves, high school educators. So again, that community is very important just to prepare students for college or higher education. Um, and as well as just preparing them for life in general, um, they can't really do it themselves because you know students just don't know. So they need that help and that backup to be able to really thrive once they leave high school. And then we also asked, um, we had a free response question asking for any advice the students and faculty would give to a student with disabilities just entering college. And most of the advice given was, were things like learn how to advocate for yourself, um, stand up for yourself. 
And then also, you know, to ask for help, which is also very important. So it kind of reinforces some of the other questions that we had asked in the survey about how students need to learn how to be independent, how to ask for that help. Um, and then also a lot of them said things like you need to find resources immediately or quickly when you get to college so that you don't struggle. Um, so the responses to this question really just backed up what um, the answers to the other questions said and really gave us an idea of kind of the most important things that students need to success be successful in higher education. So that's all we have for the, the sort of presentation portion of this. Um, we've got our contact information here. You can always feel free to reach out um, if you have ideas and want to collaborate. But um, now I'd like to open it up to the panel discussion um, and questions for our panelists. And we have a few ground rules just to kind of help facilitate discussion and make sure that everybody feels comfortable. So first and foremost, right, we all need to be respectful. Um, we all come from different places and have different experiences. Um, any of our panelists, as well as any audience members, are allowed to decline answering a question um, at any time. Um, and if you feel uncomfortable, please let us know. You can, you're can. you more than welcome in the chat to pick any one of the Seth Valetich's that are in there and <laughs> let us know in the chat. And then again, you're either welcome to unmute and ask your question or put your questions into the chat and we will um, ask them for you. Okay, so we have a question uh, that came in from Elliot. What digital library resources do you like most, like the library search databases or library guides? Um, so what have you found helpful as students in terms of like getting your research done? So. Okay, I think for me, I am like a, I struggle to figure out where to find information. So for me, library guides are very useful. Mm -hmm. Something to say like, hey, this is all the stuff we have access to. This is how you go about using it and then how you go about using it to your advantage. Because for that, like, there are so many things, especially at mine, it's like, I didn't know we had it. Mm -hmm. And if I don't know we have it, there's no shot of it. <laughs> and so having those sort of like really comprehensive guides made to be like, okay, here are all the resources we have. Here's how we use them to your advantage. I think it's really beneficial. Have you learned about any accessibility issues folks are facing with, with library resources um, through ODAC, or is it? Uh, I know some of them. Um, I know I think this is, there's a new law that says that you have to convert them all. Yeah. But I know some students have issues with, you know, the older texts that are maybe, you know, like a scanned in mm -hmm. book, because you can't, screen readers don't really work for those. Um, and so, you know, if you have dyslexia or um, a visual impairment, anything like that, they can't use their screen reader. And then so they have to figure out, you know, is there another way I can get this material? Can I get somebody to convert it over for me? Um, so I know that is one kind of hiccup is, you know, the older texts yeah. trying to get them in a format that is accessible. Handwritten pages of Handwritten, calculations yeah. and formulas. Yeah, that's an issue for everybody, though. <laughs> um, I don't know if you, you've noticed this, but have you noticed um, any particular library brands seem to be better, any of the databases seem to be better, more accessible or not? Um, or is that not something that's... I never have the, like, Els... Is it Elsevier? Elsevier. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I use that one, I have that I am able to use, like, if I mm -hmm. want to use a screen reader, those work well, because they tend to be in the PDF like well converted PDF formats. I can't say I use ProQuest all that often. Mm -hmm. I've noticed some with ProQuest, sometimes it defaults right to the window that has the PDF. Um, and so there's extra clicking. Mm -hmm. I know that, that that can be a little bit frustrating. And then also sometimes you can't get an HTML copy of the PDF is not working in mm -hmm. something like ProQuest, which I know can be a problem. Um, okay, we have another question coming in from Mariah. What is the most important thing that an instructor can do on the first day of class, where to go, uh, to help <laughs> students with disabilities feel welcome, included, and supported, especially in the summer? Um, I think one of the best things is if an instructor just, you know, 
they go over the syllabus and there's always that little blurb about you know accessibility and if I don't know when they just read straight from that blurb it's like yeah you're obligated to do that you don't maybe like it gives off the vibe that you know you don't really care but then some some professors will be like here's the blurb and then have their own you know like hey if you would need to talk to me come to my office hours email me you know they make it a little more personal so that then it sounds like you know they actually care they're not just reading something that they're required to read um and also opening themselves up saying that you know we are welcome to talk to them um and then i think also you know this is more of a i guess whatever the instructor is comfortable with but i find when instructors are open about themselves as well i'm more likely to go talk to them so we have a couple instructors on, on campus that are very open about having a disability and you know if i mean of course that's if you're comfortable sharing it but when they do that you know it it also makes it feel like oh well you'll understand a little better or you're more open to talking about this and then you know you can go talk to them even if it's not about their class you just feel more comfortable talking to them about it yeah and to build off of that like jamie said like a lot of professors will just be like okay here's the blurb that i'm required to say but doing something as simple as we're supporting, like I support students with disabilities, like that goes miles. Mm -hmm. And then I've also had professors be like, okay, like if you have accommodations, please feel free to meet with me to talk about them. If you find something in the class that isn't accessible, please tell me about it. Mm -hmm. um, I've even had professors say, if you haven't had a good experience in the testing center, you could come to my office to take the test mm -hmm. if that is what you prefer. So things like that. So we have a question from Cindy. How can a student prepare for applications and admissions if their transcript isn't going to look the same as students without IEP accommodations? I do not have an IEP. I didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had a 504. Most of my college essays were about my disability. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that made up for any discrepancy. So I wasn't able to participate in sports growing up. So a lot of my essays were like, here is how not participating in sports affected my life. And it did look worse on my college applications because I didn't have all those extracurriculars. So um, just addressing it in the for your response is how I went about it. That is a great question though, that we should, um... <laughs> I would be curious to hear what admissions wants to hear yeah. on something like yeah. that, or would uh, how our admissions team would advise yeah. students on. I agree. We'll make it up. Yeah. For next year's work. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we have a question from uh, Joya. I hope I'm not mispronouncing that. Um, were there any specific recommendations given to students with disabilities regarding excelling in STEM fields, in addition to sort of general advice on advocacy prior to college? Um, a lot of the answers were about advocacy, but then there were a handful that were along the lines of like, you need to be tough, you need to be persistent. Um, and I think that is true, especially in STEM where there's not a lot of uh, representation and there's still kind of a stigma around people with disabilities. And so just, you know, knowing that it is going to be hard, there are going to be people who maybe think a certain way about you having a disability and then having the, I guess, self-awareness and maturity to, you know, hear those things because you probably will hear them and then be able to kind of brush it off um, and keep going and keep pushing is really important. And then also, you know, finding those resources is important as well because you'll definitely need them. <laughs> yeah. The biggest piece of advice I was told was that you should educate others and that makes it less intimidating. So like I have a very rare disability and most of my problems run into, oh, I don't believe you have that disability. And so it's like knowing how to be like, no, this is how it affects me. It's rare, but it is real. Um, and knowing how to communicate that in a way that I'm comfortable in was the biggest piece of advice. Yeah, kind of similar to that. Um, was being able to like kind of combat misconceptions 
So like I'm autistic and there's a lot of kind of pre, like it's a spectrum obviously. <laughs> and so there's a lot of preconceived notion about where on that spectrum I sit. And so being able to convey like, if someone's say, oh, well, like everyone's a little bit autistic, like actually no, they're not. <laughs> and being able to kind of inform that perspective so that people can better understand how I'm affected by my disability and see that open forward. Mm -hmm. We have another question here from Marianne. Um, I would love to hear more about your student organization, Ortiger's Disability Activism and Community, what peer support and or what peer support do students need um, and what strategies really help? Oh, I should <laughs> We love ODAC. They are awesome. <laughs> Um, so ODAC, um, it's kind of twofold, like the name says, we do meet with campus leadership, we actually meet with, a, we call it Colontarian Friends, they're the head of like student life, head of disability services, the DINA presidential fellow, they invite in like head of facilities, that kind of thing, so we were able to get, actually we've met with them I think four times this semester, yeah. it used to be semesterly, now we meet with them multiple times, so we're able to meet with those kind of executive team type people. And it seems like we've really been able to get things done that way. We also do like panels for, um, for instructors and just campus in general. But then we also have that community bit where we hold, we call them productivity nights, um, where students, staff, faculty, alumni, anybody can come in and you know just sit there we're supposed to be doing work, but most of the time we just hang out and talk. Um, but that really gives kind of that space where you know it's a safe space. You know you can just, you don't really have to mask. You don't need to, you know, pretend to be something you're not. And you can talk to each other about like the trouble that you're having and just have those peers around you to talk about that since, you know, there's not really anywhere else that you can really have that. Um, and then we also just hold just random events to get students together as well. Like we had craft night, we've done, I think we did like a game night at one point. Um, so really just, you know, doing things to get students together so that, you know, you can meet people who have similar experiences to you and just talk. Because sometimes that's all you need is to just complain for a little bit. The tours, do you touch the tours at the beginning of the semester or like, did you do a tour during orientation for students? Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. DSS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we go to uh, the DSS. What is it called now? Early movement orientation? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, our disability services does a like orientation for students who have disabilities who are registered with them. And so ODAC goes there just to tell them about ODAC and then also give them a forum to just talk to current students. You know, so at orientations, a lot of the time, it's just faculty and staff. But I think having that kind of ability to talk to current students who actually are having the, the experiences that st these students are going to have is really helpful for them as well. I think another really cool part of ODAC is that you don't have to, so like to register with disability services, you need to have a documented diagnosed disability, which is a huge barrier for a lot of people. And I know there are a lot of students who come into college without that diagnosis but suspect that, you know, they have something. And so ODAC is able to provide a community for those type of people as well to say like, you can still obviously come and join mm -hmm. us and participate and all of these things. And you don't need that, what could be really expensive or really difficult to get documentation mm -hmm. that you would need to register with the school. Yeah, We can't provide accommodations, but it's still, you know, they're still able to have that community of peers. We are trying to work with disability services so that they don't have to have that official doc or official diagnosis. They can have other supporting documents, but we're working on it. <laughs> yeah. And I would say the last big uh, peer support thing that we provide is conversations about, oh, this professor was really great in giving me accommodations. Mm -hmm. This professor provided accommodations without me going through DSS or um like, I like this one fidget toy, and it's helped me to train. <laughs> um, things along that, that line of, this is what works for me, does it also work for you? And just expanding everyone's bubble. 
We have another question here about Speechify. Have any of you used Speechify? Do you do text to speech? Mm -hmm. I do text to speech sometimes, but not always. Yeah. I have used Speechify. I like it. I think it works well. And it's like open, like you don't have to pay for the like basic mm -hmm. version type thing, which is really nice. I think a lot of schools, like I can't remember if mine does, sometimes we'll pay for the full version of a lot of that type of software. They but, pay for it, but only if you have an accommodation yeah, that get it because they don't have the money to pay for it for everyone. Yeah. So it's nice mm -hmm. to see like kind of the open access versions of it because like my disability, I don't need a speech text. So mine isn't going to pay for it for mm -hmm. me, but it can be beneficial sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just nice to be able to hear things in different formats or if not, I don't have the energy to feel like reading, it's <laughs> read to me. And so it's one of those things that just makes it more equitable for everyone to be able to access. Well, I'd be curious if any of our attendees have good experience with something like Speechify or others that um, that have also worked for you. Feel free to add that into the chat. Um, any other questions? You're also welcome to unmute or raise your hand or whatever. I have a question. Okay. Um, so what are some of the best experiences and most supportive experiences that you've had um, at minds and have made you feel like you, it's possible to succeed in, in a STEM discipline? Um, my best experience came from, so I work with metals a lot and that involves intense heat treatments that I can't do because of my disability. And um, I went up to my professor, I was like, hey, I can't do this project. And I was like kind of freaking out that I was missing the value of the assignment. And he was just like, oh, that's okay. Like, you you could just get someone else to do it. I'll walk through the actual, what you're missing with you. And then I had probably five people volunteer right off the bat after overhearing me say, I can't do this, that they will do it for me. And that just made me feel great that I had that community. Yeah, I think mine has been similar with the, like, if you approach a professor and I'm like, hey, like, this is not working for me. Like, just something about it is not, like, either physically working or it's just not clicking in my brain. And when they're like, okay, let's let's see how we can address that. Mm -hmm. So then I'm still able to understand the value of the content and learn, like, what it's going to be like to be an engineer without the, like, getting stuck on the hurdle of some little thing that was going to prevent me from doing it in the first place. Um... I think something is being in ODAC, we do a lot of, um, we've done workshops for different departments, we've done panels, things like that. And I think just seeing everybody that shows up to those panels and is very open to listen to us, open to new ideas. And then especially when we do, um, we recently did a workshop for the admission students who give the tours of campus and interact with incoming students all the time. And I think seeing that even the students are open to learning and they had some really good questions for us and we're very respectful about it. So just seeing the, I guess, support and people wanting to learn on campus is really nice, especially, you know, if you've got that one professor who just isn't very helpful and then you go to this panel where these, there's all these people who want to help you, it's really, it's a really good feeling. So we had another question um, from Elliot. I'm wondering if box lens is something that you've used for things like data visualization. That is not something I have heard of. Yeah, me neither. I am super Keep curious on. to check it out, though. Looks more like. Oh, love So on the flip side, if you're if you feel comfortable answering it, what's the worst experience that you've had? Yeah. So. Um, there was one time that I was in a lab and it was probably 90 degrees in the room and that is far too hot for me. I had an exam the next day. So I go up to the professor and I'm like, I like I have accommodations with DFS. I'm allowed to leave, but like, is there anything I could do to make up for it? And she just goes, you're missing the most important day of the entire class. Like, I can't like, you should really try to stay. You need to try to stay. And I was like, I was like, oh, wow, like she's saying it very loud. So other students are hearing. And luckily I had like a good support system in that room that was like, no, like she's leaving. We'll get the content to her. But it was just the right off the bat, like you're missing important things. You should try to stay when I knew I couldn't. 
and trying to push the boundaries that I knew I needed to set was the worst experience I've had. Mine is very similar. It's when professors think that my accommodations are up for debate. Like, they're not. They've been established in conjunction with the medical team and with the school's disability support services. They are not like something that's open to interpretation or anything like that. But when professors seem to think that they are, is really frustrating. So I come and say, okay, like I have testing accommodations, which means I need to take in this environment so that I can focus. I need extra time because my brain takes a while to process. And they're like, oh, well, it's just a 10 minute quiz at the beginning of class. Like, just take it with everyone else. It's like, that is not how that works. <laughs> like, I have the documented accommodations for it, and you need to adhere to those. And trying to be assertive with professors with that can be really challenging, especially when there's kind of that inherent power dynamic, like they're in charge of me. And so having to be like, oh, actually, you can't do that, and you do need to adhere to these can be kind of a rough step to have to take. Um, so yeah, all of my accommodations are things that I actually would have to go through like different departments at the school for. So things like having an accessible classroom. Um, so the professors can't really debate it <laughs> because uh, I have to talk to people who are more powerful in the school than them. Um, but I have had professors that, you know, complain like when we have to move a classroom because the elevator's out, because the elevator's always out. Um, <laughs> And they complain, you know, like, oh, the classroom they moved us to, like, I don't like it, things like that. Or professors look at me and say, well, why do you need an accessible classroom? Because I don't use crutches or a wheelchair. Or, well, I have a cane in my backpack, but I don't use it all that often. So, you know, just that questioning, like, well, why do we have to move the class for you? Or complaining about it, like as if it's a burden for them. Like, I don't really want to move the classroom either, but I also would like to be able to get to class. So um, it's just kind of the professors that, you know, don't have that sensor to realize that what they're saying may be offensive to me, hurtful to me. Um, I think those are some of the worst experiences. I have another question here. Realizing that you do not necessarily have physical disabilities, is there anything you would recommend for encouraging students with disabilities to participate in field work? Ooh, I can start off with this one. So I'm an environmental engineer. Obviously, that involves there's a lot of like field sampling, going out and doing things. And MINES does a class called Field Session, which is literally over the summer. You go do field sampling, have a bunch of stuff. It's like a huge class for a major, and students find it really valuable. I am very heat sensitive, and I was like, well, I'm just going to die. <laughs> That's the sort of thing. But the professor was actually really good and they let me know. Like, I reached out and was like, hey, I have some concerns about this. And they were so receptive of being like, okay, we would love for you to have this experience. So let's try and make it work for you with the realization that if it doesn't, we will find a way to communicate the content. But they were able to actually end up getting an accessible field site. So we were able to drive almost all the way to our location, which eliminated having to hike with a lot of field gear, um, which would have resulted in me pretty much passing out immediately. And so we were able to do that. We were able to bring, they were like, we'll make sure you have a cooler with you that has supplies you need. We'll make sure like you can do this, this, and this to accommodate you during that. And so it let me still have the experience. And it just required some kind of like more planning at the start of everything. And so I think like, I was terrified to go into the field because I don't know what's going to happen. But the combination of them being so receptive and communicative with me and then being willing to do the work to prepare to make sure I was going to be okay was super appreciated. Um, so, yeah, I do have physical disabilities, but I'm also electrical engineering. So the most field work I've done was in the garage on a car. <laughs> um, but... And that was senior design, so that's pretty self, I guess, regulating anyway. The professors don't really care what you do as long as, you know, you don't hurt anybody. <laughs> but um, one thing that I kind of recommend that I've done for labs where I know I might have issues is just talk to the professor beforehand um, or even like before you register, talk to them just to let them know and see what solutions they have, see if you can figure something out. Because, I mean, field work sounds scary, but a lot of the times there is something that they can do so that you can act, so that it's accessible, and so that, you know, you're not hurting yourself or being unsafe to do the field work. Because, I mean, 
usually they thought about this at some point about how they would, you know, hold this class if somebody had whatever disability. So just, you know, being open about your disability. And then also with field work, I'm pretty sure you do a lot of group stuff, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Like, especially like the, I guess, not field work that electrical engineers do, but the not inside lab work. Um, we do it a lot of it with our groups. So I've always been pretty open with my group about what my limitations are. And I found that most students are okay with that and will ask if you need help. They'll, you know, if you can't do something, they'll pick up the slack and then you can pick up the slack somewhere else. So I found that students are really helpful as well, just letting your group members know what's going on. Yeah, I agree with everything. <laughs> just having that open dialogue is intimidating, but really important. Like overall, we are paying for an experience going to school. And just because we have a disability doesn't mean we're not entitled to that experience. And having accommodations is not necessarily a burden on like the people organizing the event. And so like what I would do going into like, if I'm going into a factory that I know is going to be hot, I would have a conversation with the lead professor and be like, okay, this is somebody who knows about my disability that I, if it is too hot and I need to leave, I will leave with them. I need you to trust me that you may not think it's hot, but to me it's too hot. And then we'll have a conversation afterwards and kind of creating a plan beforehand if they can't have those accommodations in there. Yeah, I think the the key word there is beforehand yeah, too, because yes. if you tell them, you know, the day that you're going on this, you know, going wherever, they're probably not going to be able to accommodate you because a lot of the times accommodations do take time. So just, you know, planning ahead and having that forethought to talk to somebody about it is really important. And that's something really nice that professors can do like in advance mm -hmm. is be like, hey, in a couple weeks, like we're going to go visit this field site or we're going on trip to like this facility, you know, and just like the getting on it on people's radar so that people then were like, oh, I might have an issue with that, can reach out and make arrangements instead of, because I have professors periodically who will be like, great news, we get to go to a facility tomorrow. And I'm like, ah, like there is no time <laughs> to set up for how this is going to work for me. So having that advance notice so that everyone involved can plan appropriately is really helpful. When that goes beyond just students with disabilities, mm -hmm. that's good for all students, yeah. right? Like this basic communication right? That benefits parents, that benefits non-traditional students. Somebody's got to go to work right after class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, one other question from Joya. Um, following up on the disclosure of disabilities to instructors, my understanding is that instructors are provided guidelines on accommodations to offer, but not details about specific disabilities. Um, some literature suggests that some instructors believe having knowledge about students' disabilities would enable them to provide more accessible instruction. Do we have a uh, in perspectives? Um, I think that it would help, but also it's important to understand that not everybody is confident or willing to share the specifics of their disability. Um, sometimes disabilities can be kind of personal or, you know, they just don't want to share them. And so that's part of that, you know, at the beginning of the semester, let people know you know, I'm open to talk to you, let me know if you need any help. Um, and then the students who do need that help, who are comfortable talking about it, will come talk to you. Um, and then also just telling them, you know, I don't need to know specifically what's going on with you. Just let me know if, you know, there's a an accommodation you think would be helpful. Um, just because then, you know, then they don't have to tell you specifically what's going on. They can just tell you, hey, it'd be really helpful if for this test, I could take it in your office. And then you don't, they don't have to share their specific disability with you and they can keep that privacy. Yeah, I have a similar perspective on that. It's also, I feel like it would be incredibly overwhelming if you have a class <laughs> of like, with five disabled students, each of their needs are gonna be so incredibly mm -hmm. individualized. So maybe more generally like, not like information and knowledge on what, accommodations are and what like generally they look like um yeah yeah it's also because you know like you might those five students might all be dyslexic but they all need something different yeah. you know 
So even if you do know their specific disability, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to help them. Um, just because, you know, you might have the same disability, but everybody's different. Everybody was taught to deal with it differently. So, and everybody has different degrees of that disability. So yeah, that's also a hard one. It's just, there's not really any generalizing with disabilities. Yeah. <laughs> I think we maybe have time for one more question if anyone has one. Speaking to that last question as a librarian who goes into classrooms, I count on the classroom faculty to tell me mm -hmm. about accommodations that I need um, to be able to work with. And I am very proactive about reaching out to my faculty um, ahead of time um, about saying, okay, so so who needs what accommodations do I need to meet to for, for students to participate. I don't even know to know who it is mm -hmm. or how many students. I just need to know, like, do I need large print handouts? Do we need um, to restructure activities? Mm -hmm. um, and so I really count on faculty because if I get blindsided walking into a classroom, the lesson is, I mean, it's basically mm -hmm. a waste of a lot of people's time. I think it's also, I'm a lab TA. And so lab TAs don't get the email from disability services, but we still, some of the accommodations we still should know because like I play music during my labs, but if somebody has an accommodation or something that says, hey, I need a quiet space. If I don't know that, I'm just gonna play music because I like having music. And then the student may not feel comfortable coming up to me because it's also a weird power dynamic when you're a lab TA because like I'm a student, you're a student. A lot of the times we have the same classes together, we're friends. And so there may be that kind of weird dynamic so just knowing what the accommodations are so that I can be prepared and then that student doesn't need to come up to me and potentially feel uncomfortable is really helpful. And I try to ask the professors beforehand, but students who don't have disabilities or aren't in that world wouldn't know to ask. Yeah. So that's something instructors can do is just share, share that before, you know, the semester starts or the lab starts so that everyone's prepared. Could you stop uh, sharing your screen, okay. Jamie? Uh, and then we'll potentially. We'd like to thank you yeah. all yeah. for attending. And of course, our wonderful students, thank you so much. Yeah, we're so grateful for them. Um, and I, I feel like I've learned a ton. Um, every time I hear them talk about their experiences, it's, um, it's enlightening. Yeah.